watchman for the morning. Over the course of 28 years of ministry, I've sat with hundreds of families in dozens of hospital waiting rooms. It's an antagonizing time filled with sorrow, loneliness, and fear. Virtually every family tells me that waiting is the worst part. No one seems to enjoy this kind of passive waiting. But another kind of waiting moves to put up trees, light candles, and hang wreaths. This anticipation brings joy. It thrills our souls. We look forward to it all year long waiting for the appearance of the Christ child. As we mark each day off the calendar, the excitement grows, moving us to acts of love and kindness toward friends and strangers alike. We wait full of hope because we know the good news is coming to a manger and unto our hearts. The Advent, may we join the palms in singing I wait for the Lord more than watchmen wait for the morning. That sleepy guard on the last watch of the night stands to an, with anticipation of the sunrise that will set him free from his toil. In a similar way, we wait for the month with excitement for the appearance of the sun who will set us free. Let us pray. Loving God, fill our lives with hope that moves us in acts of kindness. Amen. Amen. Stand and deliver. Oh dear. <laughs> and you will. <laughs> you will. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Waiting on my Prince Charming. He should be coming shortly. <laughs> oh. Did everybody have a lovely Thanksgiving? Amen. Oh, yeah. And everybody just ate their little, just one little small. <laughs> Sir. Yes. At one time, and they didn't go back for more, and they didn't go on the sofa. And they went out and walked after they ate, right? How many did that? <laughs> I know that's right. <laughs> okay. Today our lesson is Trusting with Hope, and you guys sung the song, Standing on the Promises. So hope, promises, trust, they all sort of tie in together. But if you don't have the hope, then you're not going to look forward or count on the promise. So our lesson today, we're starting lesson one in the new series, and it's called Promise, our winter series. Trusting with hope. And our scripture, our background text is from Genesis. So as you see, they keep going back into the beginning with our Sunday school lessons because it seems like the world has got so far off from God. And they have forgot so many things and they have uh, conformed to this world, the Christians, the church. So I think that's why most of our lessons are going so much back into Genesis because when we get off track or we get lost, the best thing to do is try to go back where you came from and start over again. So this is just like sort of a memory. So our background scripture is Genesis 11, 27 and Genesis 12, 9. But for today, I'm going to read the focal passage, which is Genesis 12, 1 through 9. Okay, Genesis 12, 1 through 9. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot with him. And Abram was seventy-five years old when he departed out of Haran. 
And Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their substance that they had gathered, and the souls that they had gotten in Herod. And they went forth to go into the land of Canaan, and into the land of Canaan they came. And Abram passed through the land unto the place of Sichem, unto a plain of Moriah. And the Canaanite was then in the land. And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land, and there buildeth he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. And he removed from thence into a mountain on the east of Bethel, and pitched his tent, having Bethel on the west, and Haran the east. And there he built an altar unto the Lord, and called upon the name of the Lord. And Abram journeyed, going still towards the south. And that is our focal passage today about when God told Abram, because he was not Abraham yet, to take up his stuff, his belongings, and go. He didn't know where. God just said, you know, pack up and go. So that is what Abram did. And um, Genesis gives us the beginning of everything, just like I said. Uh, it gives us the beginning of the universe, of life, humanity, the Sabbath, death, marriage, <coughs> sin, redemption, family, government, cities, art, <coughs> language, and sacrifice. All of that is in the book of Genesis. In Genesis, the eternal God, the almighty creator, he enters into a covenant with his people. At that time was the Israelites. And that's in Genesis 1, 1, and John 1, 1. And I will read this <coughs> also. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. There's no question mark. There's no check off points for you to agree or disagree. Just as in the beginning, John created, God created the heaven and the earth. And in John 1, 1, excuse me, it says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was God, and the word was with God. The word we know is Jesus. So in the beginning, there was God. In the beginning, there was Jesus. In the beginning, there was no question mark. God's covenant with Abraham is the basic plot of the scripture. Uh, to accomplish God's plan, he wanted Abram to be the father of many nations of the world through his people of Israel, the descendant of Abram. The covenant is in Genesis chapter 12 and Genesis chapter 15. And it contains a number of personal blessings on Abram, who became called the father of faith, and on all the families of the earth. It says, all the families of the earth shall be blessed, Genesis 12, 3. This promise comes in the person of the Lord Jesus, of the Lord Jesus Christ, the seed of Abraham. Right now, we are in the season of Advent, and our hope, we get excited like children, it's God's Messiah coming. It's Christmas, and we're just all like little children for Christmas time, correct? Yeah. Okay. And soon, we, right after Christmas, before you know it, we've got Easter. We've got the resurrection, crucifixion, and the resurrection of our Messiah. But that's where our hope is. That's where our hope is in the future. And we have hope for today. It's important to remember that the people in the Bible, they went through, we read over and over and over how God's people went through tremendous risks. They did things that God asked them to do. Most of the time they did not know the details. He didn't give a list. He just said, do one thing, they would do that, and then be faithful, and get continued on. And God does that with us, too. And that helps increase your faith, because you read the scripture, you learn the scripture, and it's the same God then that it is now. God doesn't age like us. God doesn't forget us. 
or anyone around us or anything that has happened, will happen, or is going to happen, because he's in God, so he's in control, so he's got the whole plan. We just don't know, we're just part of it. We're just like, a, I guess you could say, sort of like a stage play. And we all have an individual part, we don't know our parts, we don't know our future, but God does. And that's, that's our hope. That is our hope. And we need to recognize that our hope is trusting in the divine promise of God. And throughout our life, we ask that same question that the little one and two year old ask. And that question is, why? Why am I here? What am I supposed to do with my life? Is there a purpose in anything that happens in my life? How do I know what's right? How do I know what's really true? How do I know what's really false? You know, does anything I do really, really make a difference? And to who can I turn to for all these answers? Now, we as adults, we ask these questions. Our little nieces, nephews, grandchildren, great-grands, they ask these questions. They turn to us for the answers. We turn to God for the answers. We, as adults, we ask questions like, you know, why do people die? Why do people get so sick? Why are we suffering? You know, why did we lose our job? You know, I paid for my education. I got my degree. Why didn't I get the job I specialized in? Why don't I get the pay I should get? Why? Why? Why don't they let me be president of XYZ board? You know, why do they have this? Why do they have that? We continuously ask the question, why? And God has the answer to the whys in our life. Not all of the whys that we ask do we get answers. Sometimes we get the answer and we still don't understand. But God gives us the hope. We know we have our faith and hope in God. Just like that little children knows that mommy and daddy is going to give them food and clothing and shelter. That's the type of hope, faith we need to have in God. We know God's going to take care of it. We don't know how, but we know God's going to take care of it. And in Ecclesiastics chapter 1, verse 2, it says, Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. That means everything predominantly is pointless because everything's going to perish, okay? Um, when I said pointless, I didn't want to get mixed up with the word hopeless, because sometimes you say pointless and people just throw up their hands and say, what's the use of praying? What's the use of going to church? What's the use of this? What's the use of that? You know, you said <coughs> that it was vanity, that it's all going to perish, so why am I doing it? We're not staying here in this world, we're passing through, okay? So we might be, it might be pointless, some of the things that we do, but we're not hopeless. And in Ecclesiastes 3.13 it says, this is what God said, that every man should eat and drink and enjoy the good of all of his labor. And it is a gift of God. So that's God's will for us. And Ecclesiastes 3.20, and when this life is over, all go one place. All are of the dust, and all turn to dust again. That doesn't make us feel too happy, but that's the reality mm -hmm. of it. So we just have our hope in God. Now, in between life and death, you know how you have your, in your obituary, you see the birth date, you see this dash, and then you see your checkout date. On that dash is where we're at. Thank goodness. Okay. <laughs> Hang on to the dash, okay? Um, all things God can and will restore. He does restore our sanity, but we get depressed, and we don't know what's going on. He restores our hope. Life is not easy. He did not say it would be easy. He said to be faithful. He didn't say be easy. Our God knows that our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus Christ and His righteousness. 
and all who want to save their lives will lose it. That's scripture, that's 924. But remember Jesus said, all who lose their lives because of me will save them. And what that means is that you live your life for Christ. You don't live your life for self. Uh, we have a choice and we can cling to the delusion that we make it on our own. You know, I, that I said, I this, I that. Or we can acknowledge our ability not to be able to fix what's wrong. I don't know how many times in my life I have tried to fix what's wrong and made it so much worse. But we think sometimes that we can fix what's wrong. And sometimes we can, but we need to pray and go to the Holy Spirit for God, and he will guide us to fix some things in our life that are wrong. But we cannot fix the whole world and everybody in it. Um, we can respond in trust in the divine hope of God, now and in the future. Sort of swayed from the lesson, but I wanted to make sure that we understood the hope that we do have. When God summoned Abram to a new life in a new land, God gave a sevenfold promise of his divine blessing. And I'll give you those seven. The first one that God gave Abram was to make him a great nation. Now given the fact that his wife, Sarah, was unable to have children, <laughs> Abram, how am I going to be a father of a great nation? Okay, But that was God's first promise. His second promise was to bless Abram and provide for him and he would not suffer. And we know the psalm, great is thy faithfulness, okay? And that is what kept Abram. He believed God. God said, you won't suffer. He didn't take much with him. But he said, you won't suffer and you won't you know, want it. You'll be okay. The third promise that he gave Abram was his name would be respected. Because every place he went, everybody didn't like him. That goes for us also. Everybody doesn't like us every place we go, whether we think they do or not. And unfortunately, we personally don't like everybody. We as Christians, we're supposed to. But when you get in the carnal mind and you get in reality, we don't. But God promised Abram that his name would be respected. And God does not break his promises. And the fourth promise to Abram was that he would be a blessing. Now, he didn't have a lot of belongings, so he probably wondered, well, how am I going to be a blessing when I've just got means for me and mine? But remember, it's God's promise. The fifth promise was to bless those who bless Abram. And the sixth problem, curse those who curse Abram. Oh, boy. Now, be careful there. And the seventh promise was that Abram would by the means of all the families of the earth, he would bless them all. He was going to be a father of many nations. Okay? He didn't know how. This is what God told him. And it doesn't say anything in the scripture about him, you know, like trying to have a debate with God, like how, or that question, why, how. We don't see that. We just see that God made these promises to Abram back in the country when he had a few things, a few family, when he said, take up your stuff and go. God told him you will have these blessings, these sevenfold blessings also. Now, jumping ahead, about 4,000 years later, Abraham's long gone, all of his family. 4,000 years later, the blessings that we enjoy today are still a part of Abraham. The blessings that God made on Abram go to the seed of Abraham and all of Abraham's children. Abraham is a child of God. We are a child of God. Okay? Um, when Abram obeyed God, his life and his name changed. After the birth of their son Isaac, in his old age, Abram became Abraham. 
and Sarai became Sarah. And Isaac means he laughs because when Abram came to Sarah in her old age, she's like 90, and he says, you know, we're going to have, you know, this child, and we're going to be a father, or I'm going to be a father of many nations, you know. I think she thought he lost his last <laughs> button on his coat. You know, and she laughed. But they had Isaac. God does not make a promise and not keep it. Okay? So, um, the basic story of Abraham is Sarah, we, we always know. I didn't go into the detail about that, about the land that he moved to, because we'll be doing that later on in the lessons. I thought today, for it being the 1st of December, almost the end of the year, that it was good to give us the hope more on that, because the year has, past year has been rough. Not only on Christians, but on the world. It's just like, you know, where is God? What is going on? But he's there, okay? And then this time last year, you know, I was sick puppy. You know, everything was spinning and all kinds of things were going on, you know, but not today. So I thank God for that. So I want us to have the hope. Um, our closing prayer, is there any comments or questions first? Yes. You know, in the South, you can say something about someone as long as you say, well, bless their heart. <laughs> Be careful. It's <laughs> also the scripture, Be still and know that I am God. <laughs> no matter what's going on in the world, He is still God. That's right. Okay. That's, right. That's, That's right. right. That's right. So our closing prayer, thank you, God, <coughs> for today and for tomorrow and for our family and for our life and for our hope that we have in your name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Janice. That was a great lesson. But you're going to have to go out and find Patrick. Patrick, I'm lost. I'm going, yeah. I'm going to go see. But he's okay. I see the car a lot. Well, maybe he's just sitting there, but, okay, he wasn't feeling as good as he should. Thank you, Andy. You make it sound so good. Yes. <laughs> um, this excuse is the me, last, oh, excuse me, I'm going to look for Patrick. Okay. If I don't make it up, then I'll see you guys down in the sanctuary. He should be okay. If I need help, I'll call. <laughs> <laughs> we can put out a silver Thank alert. Except his hair is not silver. <laughs> um, let's see, we have, I think, 37, Tom? Yeah. 37 reservations for our Christmas crazy party. Don't forget your white elephant gift. Okay. Um, does that include the ministers and the wives? Okay, okay. Um, Jack from the heritage class dropped off an invitation to their Christmas party. So if anybody is interested, I do have the information. It is on December 12th, and they are having theirs at the River City Brewing Company. But I'll put the invitations up here, and you can help yourself. Um, Tom. Yes. Yeah, our treasurer. <laughs> okay, for the camp. Um, Madison, we have collected. You mean for the ranch? Yes. Yeah. Uh, Two hundred dollars. Okay, so. That's what we usually get. Okay. All right. So we will take. Uh, we'll make arrangements to buy the gift cards for Christmas for the children, and uh, my daughter works for FedEx, so we will FedEx them over to the ranch. Um, is there any other any announcements today? Um, Bill did talk to Sissy. And do you want to give us an update, Bill? Well, she is still, uh, her husband is at home now and requires 24 hour coverage. She still can't walk and he can't get up. So she is going to be out, I assume, for the rest of this month, although she said she might come back and do Christmas. But, you know, that is sort of iffy, but 
and I'll keep in contact with her, so we'll keep up on that. Okay. Her prayers, I think she's under a lot of stress. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure she is under a lot of stress. Um, Richard is probably very good. Yeah, yeah. Hopefully she has. Hopefully she has good help, and she can get out um, periodically. Well, it, it remains to be seen. I'll keep in contact with her. Okay. Keep on. Okay. Tom will be back from uh, Panama City uh, next weekend, and he's going to do the lesson for us next week. Um, we have a lot of people traveling, so keep them in your prayers. And let's uh, remember Sissy in a very special prayer from all of us. Okay, okay Bill, you want to leave us laughing? A man and his wife were driving their RV across the country and came to Florida and were nearing the town of Kissimmee. They noted the name on the sign and tried to figure out how to pronounce it. Kissimmee? 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 And they argued that among themselves, but they were also hungry. So they pulled into a restaurant to get something to eat. At the counter, the man said to the waitress, my wife and I can't figure out how to pronounce this place. Would you tell me where we are and say it very slowly so I can understand? The waitress looked at him and said, Burger King. <laughs> <laughs> A small town farmer who spent all of his life in a little town of less than 200 people had never left that town during his whole life. So he, his wife, and son went to visit the big city for the first time. While his wife went shopping, the farmer and the son explored the large buildings. Upon entering one skyscraper, they saw an elevator open and an old woman enter, and the doors closed. A couple of minutes later, the doors opened and a young woman stepped out. <laughs> Hurry, said the farmer, go get your ma. I'm going to run her through this machine. <laughs> if you all stand.